Victory blast like birds. They come through the window wild and lost. They are trapped under the high dome ceiling of the cafe, darting round between us, striking walls and glass, knocking the dishes from the shelves. And we know until they stop their terrible motion, until they see swooping and darting and banging into the walls, until they alight, come to rest, exhausted, spent, there is nothing at all to do. Plates and halves and triangles on the floor, a group of ceramic mugs, fat and split like overripe fruit, the chandelier, a pendulum, still swings. The owner, the waitress, the other few customers sit. I am up at the windows. I am watching the people pour around the corner, watching them run toward us, mouths unhinged, pulling at hair, scratching at faces. They collapse and puff up, hop about undirected, like wild birds frightened like people possessed, tearing at their forms, trying to set something free. Jerusalemites do not spook like horses. They do not fly like moths into the fire. They have come to abide their climate, terror a second winter as part of their weather, something that comes and then is gone. Watching plumes of smoke, the low clouds of smoke that follow the people down the street, I suddenly need to be near the fire, to be where the ash still settles and cafe umbrellas burn. I make for the door and the waitress stops me. The owner puts a hand on my shoulder. Calm down, Natan. Sit down, Natan. Have a coffee, not time. The waitress is already on her way to the machine. I feel an urgency the others dismiss. I can run with a child to a breaking ambulance, can help the barefooted find their shoes. The time, 316, my girlfriend late to meet me. I should be turning over bodies, searching for a face. I guess at this point I say Boston, but uh, uh, you know it's the standard, standard Ashkenazi Jewish roots, which is that everybody is uh, terribly confused, and one relative will tell you Vienna, and another will say Russia, and but you know somewhere, somewhere Russia, Austro-Hungarian Empire. But on my mom's side, my relatives, I have a great grandfather who's born in Louisville, and a great grandmother born in Boston, and so we've been here a few generations. First in my family to write, but you know, basically the first in my neighborhood. I feel like there are two histories because there's a family history, but then there's also a communal neighborhood history, which is a different thing. You know, having grown once once you grow up, being born into a religious closed community, it doesn't really matter where anyone come from because they're just the understood. There are rules, so it's not even that idea if there's anyone in your family who's done anything before. There are the things that we do, acceptable choices, acceptable places to live, acceptable lives. When you 
grow up in a closed world, there is no thought of leaving or of doing anything else. The, the, if you're miserable in that world, then you understand you're set up for a life of misery. That's it. When, I, when you have a single interest and a single purpose for me, which is to tell stories, to tell the best stories that I can and to give everything to that, I got two things from that community. And one is uh, dedication, even when you're hopeless, which is you write just the same as praying and eating kosher and any of that other stuff. You write whether you, you know, believe that you can write that day or you think you're working on the wor worst thing in the world or are hopeless. Whatever it is, you do the work and you sit there and do it. And, you know, that is your job, that is your role on earth. I don't write at home, I, I, I find, I mean the writing life is a deeply isolating life. If you're an introvert, it's perfect. But what if you're a social being who likes to write? For me, this is, you know, the antidote to loneliness. I just, I've always been a coffee shop writer. I have a, you know, Tomoso film in Jerusalem and Java House in Iowa City and, I don't know, I fell in love with this. When I first started writing actually, you know what? I've been coming here since 1991, I guess. But I don't know, it's just a great atmosphere. It's, you know, I, I sit here, I, I say get here at, you know, two o'clock in the afternoon and I often close the place at 11.30 at night. It's a bottomless, you buy one cup of coffee, re refills are free. So I sit here all day. Having moved and lived in, you know, 20 different apartments now, like, don't become attached to a desk. That's a very large thing. So I like these pens. They're easy to get, you know. So in a sense, you know, at anxious times, I do think, what if this place would close? And I definitely have a plan to make the first bid, should they ever sell it, because I will buy it and keep the table in the back. But um, yeah, you know, I, I could move if I had to, but I do, I do like this place. And separate from Jerusalem, one of the things about moving back to New York was was again the the unbroken the unbroken dream that writing demands and the continuum in Jerusalem there's always some shock or another holiday or some reason that something is closed this place is open i think it's closed christmas day and then one monday night before that they sing christmas carols you know where i usually run out and the waitresses they're still mad at me cuz i don't stay for I tell them I'm Jewish, they don't care, but they want me for Christmas cards. But yeah, this place is open and, you know, basically every day of the year from, you know, morning till night. And that to me is just, in New York, the city, you know, another reason I love this place is that it provides whatever is your focus is, there are enough people with the same disease here to, to make you feel, you know, normal or part of a place. In a chair, drinking coffee, holding the owner's hand. There is nothing to do outside, no one to rescue. Who is already there is who's helping Natan. If you are not in the eye when it happens, it's already too late to put yourself in. I trade a picture of my girlfriend dead for one of her badly wounded. In bar with her face burned off, hands blown off, a leg severed near through. I will play the part of supportive one. I will bunch up and hold the sheet by her arm, smile and tell her how lucky she is to be alive and in a position where, having discussed it in a happy bed, in a lover's bed, we had both sworn we'd rather die. Phones are back, the streets secured, soldiers everywhere taking up posts and positions, fingers curled by triggers. 
An Arab worker comes out of the kitchen with a broom. I'm the first to reach the phone, but I can't remember numbers. One woman slams a portable against the table as if this will release the satellite from the army's grip. I'll dial nonsense and hang up, unable to recollect even the code to my machine. Natan will be okay, I promise, before leaving. Natan is a grown man, he can find his way home. On the street, I'm all animal, I'm all sense, all smell and taste and touch. I can read every stranger's intentions from scent, from the flex of a muscle, the length of pe the passing of our eyes. I'm on the corner and can turn up the block, take a few strides into the cl closest of kill zones. I can tour the stretch of wounded, weeping and dead, unmoving, walk past the blackened and burned, still smoldering ghosts. The Hasidim will soon come to collect scattered bits, partial Christs, parts of victims nailed up, screwed in, driven to stone and metal, hand pierced with rusted nail and hung on the base of a tree. It is with true force, with a bit of higher thought that I can muster that I spell myself a lifetime of dreams. I guess there's two different continuums. I mean, there's the neurotic writer things, you know, I always, you know, micro pen, not the fine, you know, always the yellow hardback notebook. And, but um, it's, it's interesting with every year more that I write to learn, again, things that tie into religion, that tie into writing, that tie into yoga, that tie into training. It's uh, the tie into, uh, you know, the world at large, but I mean, there are seasons. Like, it's it's very nice for me. I see it all on a, the, the, the process is a continuum. You know, that I sort of see as a, a lateral thing. But really, it's, it's nice to see, it's very circular as well. Like, it's nice to see the cycles of writing as the years go by. So in a big picture way, it's nice to have learned even where the frustrations fit into the continuum. Come and hang out in the West Village when you were young. Yeah, that was uh, embarrassingly like everybody else. But really, when we were in suburbia, this was, it was just, I mean, it was just wild for us to come here. And... So did you tell your parents you were be gonna become a writer, or did it just I don't know happen? what parent takes that seriously. It's not, again, you know, I didn't think it was possible, and I don't know if they thought it was possible that I'd stick with it, you know. I guess I don't think about myself as that stubborn, but, but uh, I mean, maybe, maybe uh, yeah, I don't know if anyone takes it that seriously. I measure most everything I do in feet. I, uh, honestly, like I have, you know, 27th man, I have, three feet, you know, I, I know which story, like Tumblr is five feet, so of the, of the novel which I draft in longhand, I have, uh, I mean, I just finished, I have a legal, you know, I, I've, I've at least crossed the one meter mark at this point, but I write everything longhand, and then I type it in, which gets me another draft, and then when I print it out, I write it all longhand again. But I guess I just always, there was always a respect for art in the house, so, with, with everything, you know, all the things that were forbidden or that we were too scared to do or not supposed to do. Yeah, the writing thing was never, never not supported. I just don't know if anybody knew that I would not give up. You know, I remember, you know, running with a friend in Jerusalem. It's a, you know, I'd say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm gonna kill myself. I'm gonna hang myself. This story's, you know, it's hopeless. It's over. And he'd say, what are you, week nine? I'd say, yeah, week nine. He's like, oh, you always wanna hang yourself at week nine, you know? Suicide week 10, joy week 11. So. It's nice even to see how, you know, the, the emotions fit into the cycle. But um, 
My day is the same every day. So I thought you might want to see this uh, three-story picture of a woman biting a man on the ass. And the Housing Works, works uh, Use Book Cafe, which is just, A, it's an excellent space, but uh, all the proceeds go to charity, which is just a lovely idea. Um, so yeah, I gave one of my first readings here when the book came out, or maybe even before, but I remember being nervous. But it was a, it's a great space for reading too, and the New Yorker has all their, a lot of their parties here. So uh, let's go in. Let's go have a look. So it's a great space, mm -hmm. and I can, uh, you can caffeinate. I can recharge my personality. <laughs> so. So yeah, they clear it out. They do readings at night, and they move all the stuff out of the way in parties. And... Nice. Sounds like I'm trying to rent you the space, <laughs> but I'm not. Well, anyway, should we roam through the books, or should we get a yeah, coffee let's... first and then roam? Sure. Why yeah. don't we do that? Can I get two coffees? Two coffees. I guess. So what's the last book you read? Uh, oh, my, that was excellent. Um, it, it took a lot of work, and I just loved it. Um, but yeah, Makioka Sisters, Tanizaki. Now I bought them all. <laughs> but that's it. You say American culture is all over. Like, there's, um, we can be right, right away. There's a lot of places to put the comma. I hope it's not all over. But uh, you know, for now, they're still translating American writers. And you know, it's very weird for me. Do you read a lot when you're writing, or do you read less? Uh, read differently, like, hey, and now that I'm, can't stop pointing to the gray hairs enough, but uh, now that I'm in my 30s, there's a male, you don't even need kids, there's like a dad gene that hits men at 30 and suddenly you have this great interest in nonfiction and want to carry a big presidential like I'm reading Truman, you know, so I feel, oddly, I've been reading all this nonfiction lately. Yeah, I, I didn't talk about politics forever, I mean, I just, I said, why, you know, I wrote a book, how can you ask me? I have a friend, I always like, a uh, friend's little brother, and now he's big enough to tease me back. But uh, he always says, you know, he'll be like, I heard, you know, I heard you on the radio. You know, he'll hear, hear these panels, and it'll be like, you know, the scientist from NASA and someone from the Environmental Commission and some, you know, professor at a university and all these people, and he'll be like, you know, and on global warming, you know, Nathan Englander, author of this book of short stories. He'd be like, what exactly are you? He's like, as far as I know, you sit in a coffee shop all day. So he, he always enjoys hearing writers added for their two cents since we make everything up and spend all our days alone. So did you read a lot when you were a kid? The sweater book. Oh yeah, the sweater important book. important volume. <laughs> did I read a lot? No, I, I, uh, I watched a lot of TV. I was raised by the TV set. My, I, should, I should actually have a, a PBS tote bag for public television, because my mother is convinced. I never went to school. The nice thing about private school, there's pluses and minuses, but the really nice thing about private school education is they basically ignore all the laws of the state, so they don't. I assume there's a minimum number of days you should attend, but I just stopped very often. I was not in school, so I'd watch you know, reruns all day. So I'm surprised all my stories aren't 22 minutes long to get a, a sitcom. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so for a long time, I didn't feel like writers should talk about anything except their books. But now I feel like if you're asking me, you know, if I'm sitting with the New York Times and they say, what do you think about, you know, what should be done in Israel? Then I say, okay, I think, I think there should be a two-state solution and Israel should, you know, close, you know, all the settlements, you know? No, I read when I was really religious. Like, that was a nice thing about having, again, things that are good are like having a, a Shabbat, a Sabbath. Like, you can't watch TV, and I would really sit down and read a novel in a day, like to curl up on a couch and oh, read it. Wow. That was just a, you'd start it Friday night and then finish it all day Saturday was just, you know.
biblical Israel crowded with warriors and prophets, fallen kings and common men conscripted to do God's will, an American boy's Israel, a child raised up on causality and symbol, Holocaust as wrath of God, Israel the phoenix rising up from the ashes. I'm swollen with heroism, the sad fact of it, curled up on the bathroom floor, woozy with the makings for a bold rescue, overdosed on my own life or death acumen. My body exercises its charger of burning buildings, its icy waters diver, the unused hero driven out while I wait patiently inside, the chandelier like a pendulum, the day like a pendulum swings. Inbar will turn the corner in her apartment and find her American boyfriend pinned to the floor, immobile, sweating a malarial sweat. She will discover him suffering the bystander's disease. She'll want to wrap him in a blanket, put him in a cab, and take him to the hospital where all the uninjured victims, the unhurt, uninvolved victims, trickle in for the empty beds to be placed on the cots in the halls. I do not want the hospital. Do not want treatment for having sat down after, for having sipped coffee after and held on to the owner's hand. There is an element of struggle. Sex that night, a matter of life and death. There is much scrambling for leverage and footing, displays of body language that I've never known. We cling and dig in as if striving for permanence, laboring for a union that won't come undone. We laugh after, we cackle and roll around, reviewing technique and execution, hysterical, absurd, perfect in its desperation. We make jokes at the expense of ourselves, no sex like near-death sex. We light up a cigarette naked, twisted up in the sheets, Again, we would not recognize ourselves on TV. Yeah, I was the... I was really the first one in my family to go abroad. I mean, that's how nobody had ever been to Europe or Israel before, you know. And, uh, on some lines, I think since they came to America, they basically got here and stayed for generations. So it, it was a college roommate was going to Jerusalem junior year and basically dragged me along. And that was, so the first time I'd ever left America was for, uh, for that, for first time I ever left America, I got a one year ticket and, you know, flew back 364 and a half days later with, I think I had 12 hours to go when we left Paris. But um, yeah, I just fell in love with being abroad and I really fell in love with Jerusalem. It's just a fascinating, fascinating city. I mean, when we talk about also me losing religion, that's when I finally gave it up. I questioned for so many years and I stopped being religious my first week. My first Shabbat in Jerusalem is when I, you know, I got on a bus from Tiberias um, back down to the city, and that was the first time I'd ever been in a, you know, vehicle on the Sabbath, and, you know, it, I, I guess I'd seen, I'd always been, they'd always demonize the, basically the other. I mean, that's how religion functions, in a sense, how do you keep in, but it's the idea that this is the right path, this is the only path, and then there's the other. It's how politics works, it's how religion works, everything the same that way.
So how come you chose to live on the Upper West Side or Morningside Heights? But uh, my, uh, all my, uh, all my writer friends, I'd say, just about every single living writer in the whole of the United States is in Brooklyn right now. Um, so I end up visiting there, which is not supposed to be a New York setup. They're supposed to come visit you on the island of Manhattan, nonetheless. But uh, yeah, this is where my old friends are. I mean, this is where we ended up after college. But I remember the first time my mom came to stay the apartment, there was a couch out front and there was two guys sitting on it smoking crack, like <laughs> with their crack pipes. And I was like, that couch is not always there. But of course, for first family visit, there was, you know, actual crack smoking at the front door. But, um, you know, it was just, uh, yeah, that's, that was 1991. So, and then we ended up on, with another person moved up to 89th Street across from the horses, from the stables, which was a great building because it was like a sort of an, you know, 19th century version of New York because you were on 89th Street, but oddly you'd wake up in the morning to the sound of the clip clop of hooves and so very weird sound effects. And that's where I stayed till Iowa. And then I left in, you know, 1994 and went out to Iowa City. say, you know, before Stella McCartney got there, but I've been going to, you know, meat packing for, I've always loved Florent. That's, it's a, my tour of New York City basically will solely revolve around food. But, uh, you know, I love to go for their goat cheese omelet in the morning, steak fried at midnight. But um, I go there a lot, meat packing and uh, just, you know, general roaming around downtown, Chelsea's village, Soho. And I like to roam the city. I mean, I spend most of my time in the back of the pastry shop in the dark, so I try and remember once in a while to get out. But my main thing, really, I mean, really at a time like this when I'm finishing the book and, you know, just really spending most of my days in the back of that coffee shop in the dark, I try really, you know, it, it, it's gone up to twice a week, but once a week or once every two weeks now to get down to Chinatown for dim sum. family-oriented place on the weekends. People are like, you know, grandma's 200 years old and then all the kids come. It's over here. Oh, you don't see those in New York. Now, uh, Miss Manor says a big man goes to
ZR, right? So all your uh, all your stories involve pretty much all your stories involve like Jewish customs. Yes, which is why we're here at the Chinese restaurant. Which is why we're here. There, at the there Chinese is no restaurant. greater New York tradition than Jews eating Chinese food and pretending it's kosher. This this can't get any more traditional. So mm. since we're eating. I gave up being religious in Jerusalem, but again, there's the chip on your shoulder factor. I don't know how far out of your way you have to go to break laws. You know, this idea, like, where do I, you know, where do I find an idol? Because I haven't done that yet. So, yeah, it was, it's pretty much a kosher town. So uh, I ended up in February or something in London. So as soon as we got from the airport and we took the train to Victoria Station and from Heathrow. So, yeah, I came out of Victoria Station. There's a Burger King at Victoria Station that's... That's my first ever cheeseburger, so, uh, yeah. But Did you I, enjoy it? Yeah, I, I, you know what? I think overall the, the McDonald's platter's tastier. I think the fries, Coke, that's, you know, it's a better burger at Burger King, but, you know, I'm more of a Big Mac man, I think. Uh, is that, excuse, oh, do you have shumai? Hey. You lost her. stages it never seems fierce but I guess it really is it really is a different set of beliefs which is just a shocking thing to rediscover so it'll be quiet for years at a time and you know, and then I'll often you know pick things that don't even matter to one person you know but again there really are like, there are central issues I mean it's I guess you just have to decide to have peace, you know, like we decide to, we decide to be a family. Was the situation in Israel like a deciding factor for you to move back to New York or? I think I want, I, the poll, I feel like I knew I was ready to come back to New York for a long time and the poll was there and it was more like I didn't want to, it's a, it's a brainwashy sort of place. And you, you can't, I mean, I see having moved there after Rabin was there, I did move there for peace. I didn't want to live in a certain kind of society that is being built there. But in the, in the end, I hope there's peace tomorrow, of course. I don't know what to tell you, except it was a great experience, and I was not thriving in Jerusalem the way I thrive in New York. That's what's hard for friends there are finally used to, but it's hard to admit when you go there, you're supposed to just, this is the place for me. So if you ask me why I'm back here, because this is the place for me. Like, I really love New York, and I, you, know, you could spend a lot of time. Uh, when I came back, wanting to leave and, and going back, it, you just justified a lot. I was one of the last American friends of mine to leave. Like, your whole phone book is crossed out. And it's funny, you know, while you're crossing out the Americans who were moving back, You've already crossed out all the Israelis, like you know anyone who can get a, get a visa. So it's funny even that there's a guilt involved because I speak more Hebrew, you know, in New York than I did in Jerusalem. I think you know, walking down the street. So anyway. I was raised on tradition, pictures of a hallowed Jerusalem nestled away like Edom, a Jerusalem so precious God spared it when he flooded the world. I can guide you to the valley where David slew Goliath, recite by heart the love songs written by Solomon his son. There have been 13 sieges and 20 downfalls, and I can lead you through the alleys of the old city, tell you a story about each one. This is my knowing, dusty book knowing, I thought I'd learned everything about Jerusalem, only to discover my information was very, very old. I moved 
through town down the street of empty windows and blackened walls. The cobblestones are polished. Even the branches and rooftops have been picked clean. Every spot where a corpse lay is marked by candles, 50 here, 100 there, temporary markers before monuments to come. I make my way into the cafe. I nod at the owner, look at all the people out to display for the cameras for each other, an ability to pass an afternoon at ease. I sit at my table and order coffee. The waitress goes off to her machine. Cradling my chin, I wrestle images, unhinged mouths and clouds of smoke, blasts like wild birds. Today is a day to find religion, to decide that one God is more right than another, to uncover in this sad reality a covenant, some promise of coming good. There are signs if one looks. If one is willing to turn again to his old knowing, to salt over shoulders, prayers before journeys, wrists bound with holy red thread, witchery and superstition, comforts. Um, part of living in Jerusalem is, is not getting blown up, you know, in that time, and, and not being very dramatic about not getting blown up. The, the idea, I, it's amazing how close you have to be to something to even claim it in Jerusalem. You know, it's, it, nobody, nobody says it and nobody wants to hear, I got off the bus and then the bus, bus blew up two stops later because we all left the market and then it blew up 15 minutes later and we're all sitting at the table that was blown up the next day. And we're, you know, it happens a lot and often and, you know, so I made a left, you know, that day I went here instead of driving down that block and then they blew up that corner. I mean, it's just, you know, endless and, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just part of life there, I guess, is, is not getting blown up or it was during that time, it, it was just, just unbelievable. I uh, now thinking about it, the stress of, the stress of just being outside then was so intense, and also so intense how much we tried to pretend that it wasn't pervasive. I mean, I think that's what that story was about for me, was letting in the idea of an American in Jerusalem because it, it seems more, you know, if I mentioned Chekhov before, but that idea of, that idea of being, you know, the sane man on the mental ward. You know, how do you, how do you talk your way out of it? But the idea of everyone claiming normality when, when life is so deeply abnormal and insane was just to me fascinating. I just like the way, I just like it down here and watching the shifting boundaries of all these neighborhoods now that Little Italy's, you know, half a block wide and sort of the, the Jewish flavor of this neighborhood's pretty much disappearing, but it's more historical. story about uh, strippers turning into naked rabbis in the New Yorker a few years ago, and I, I don't think that won a lot of friends in certain groups, but uh, but they were great. I'm really proud of the Jewish community. It's not threatening. It's, it's if I you know, had any animosity towards my characters, the fiction would fall apart. So, um, yeah, I wrote the book. Again, it's not even say I wrote it with love. That, that's cheese. You know, that's, <laughs> I'm not interested in that. I just again, did my best to build these people. It's, uh, you know, they're my characters. I, 
you know. You asked about Jewish humor. There's the most famous Jewish joke, which is the guy they find alone on a desert island, and there's two synagogues, and they say, why two synagogues? And he says, that's the one I won't set foot in. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I like this place. I was, again, here for that singer event, and I don't know. You know, maybe it says a lot more about where I am with religiosity that I sort of get along with it defunct so is synagogue. So still a synagogue? Or is it, it actually just... is. There is a, a minion, a small group of people that pray downstairs and keep it open regularly. But the last service, you know, I only learned this coming here, but it's, you know, it was in the 50s. But the place was built in 1887. And... So wh while growing up, like, what are the things that you still, of the way in which you grew up, you still keep, in a sense? or? habits or just? Yeah. I mean, they talk about the last things to go. You know, I'm a, I'm a Kohen. I'm of the priestly class. Like, I remember, you know, setting foot in a cemetery was still oddly like the, maybe one of the last, <laughs> last, last things I did. You know, and that was probably, I mean, that might have been on a, I don't know if it was to see Maimonides' grave in Israel or if it was, you know, walking through big graveyards like Auschwitz or whatever when I was backpacking through Europe. But yeah, I think that one stayed till, till the end. It's odd the things you keep and don't keep. And, um, but yeah, no, I, I pretty much don't do anything, though I, pro I'm sh I surely have a host of superstition, you know. Up, but that was in the, again, speaking of expansion before our synagogue got bigger, I, I think my, my family got there when it was still small, but they would have little brass plates with the, your name on it. You know, you had your seats, but that's a, that's a thing I really like. When you talk about the things that I keep, that I, where I do feel like dedication to anything is the same if it's serious, you know, in a certain way, but it's the makom kavua, which is your, your set place. Right. And I feel like, you know, they, you know, and the, the idea being it's not just an idea of respect or continuum, it's also an idea of focus. Like if you pray in the exact same spot every day and you have your seat, that you'll really be able to focus more. And I feel like that's the idea of right, you know, it's, you know, I have my place at the pastry shop and I have my place at Java House and, you know, you know, wherever it is. But just that idea, that second to last table against the wall, I really do think it helps, you know, like studying yoga or, you know, praying to God, whatever, whatever it is you're focusing on. I really do believe in that continuum. I very much like the idea of the assigned seat. You know, it's not just so kids don't fight on buses. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so that's that. And there, there's your holy ark. I think that's been redone. It's quite beautiful, so. I don't consider writing a painful process. It's just unbelievably intense. I mean, I, I think it's dramatic to, to call it painful in that I, I wouldn't want to do anything else. I just find it you know, often very difficult and, and intense, and it surely isn't a normal life, but I'm, I'm, I, I couldn't be any more thankful. I just love s spending my days writing. I wouldn't want to do anything else. I guess it gets back to more sort of 
philosophical ideas of what it is, you know, to be happy. I mean, I've, I've never been a heroin addict, but that might be, you know, being high on heroin might be like a truly joyous constant, but I don't think it's an ideal life even if it makes you happy. So in that sense, I feel like, uh, you know, I feel like there's a, a lot of terror and anxiety and unknown built into a writing life, but, but in a sort of bigger idea of happy, I think it's a very happy life. I mean, any, anyone who sits, you know, I love reading poetry about it or essays about it or anything about it, because it always makes me laugh, those writing life essays. Like, if you are given time to think, you are going to brood. I mean, it's, it's, it's taking on, my whole day is framing the world from infinity. That's what I do. Every thought, you know, you must define every, you know, every room, every character, every thought. It's a, it's a constant building, you know, what we do in the world. It's like when you get up on an airplane and fly across America, it could almost make you dizzy to look down and see this whole country has been cut up into grids. It's like it's so, something built into man is this, you know, crazed need to like mow down everything and make it into perfect squares. You know, you just see field after field. But in a sense, in writing, that's what you're doing is, is where in, you know, artistic process, I think it's beautiful. You have to decide, back to photography, you have to decide where the end of the picture is, you know, and what's in focus and what's out of focus. And I think writing more than anything is about, is about making that order. So, you know, it's both, it's both a hopeless process and, and about making order. A boom that pushes air, that bears down and sweeps the room. My hair goes loose at the roots. The others talk and eat. One lone woman stares off, page of a magazine held mid-turn. Fighter, the waitress says, watching, smiling, leaning up against the bar. She's world-weary, wise, the Air Force, obviously, the sound barrier broken. I want to smile back at her. In fact, I want to be her. I concentrate, taking deep breaths, studying her style, noting how to lean against a bar all full of knowing, must master loud noises, sudden moves. I reach for my coffee and rattle the cup, burn my fingers, pull my hand away. The terrible shake trapped in my hands. Yesterday sounds caught up in my head. I tap an ear like a swimmer. A minor frequency problem, I'm sure. I've picked up on the congenital ringing in Jerusalem's ears. deals with me in a waitress's way. She serves me a big round-headed muffin, poppy seeds trapped in the glaze. The on-the-house offer, a bartering of sorts. Here's a little kindness, now don't lose your mind. Anchors, symbols. The owner appears next to me, rubbing my arm. Round foods are good for mourning, I say. They symbolize eternity and the unbreakable cycles of life. I point with my free hand. Cracks in the windows are good too. Each one means another demon is gone. He smiles if, as if to say, that's the spirit, and adds one of his own. A chip in your mug, he says. In my family, it, mean, it means good things to come. And from the looks of my kitchen, this place will soon be overflowing with luck. Waitress pushes the muffin toward me as if I'd forgotten it was served. But it's not a day for accepting kindness. Inbar has warned me, stick with routine. Lynn has warned me, don't blink your eyes. And even this place has its own history of warnings. One set accompanying its every destruction and another tied to each rise. The balance that keeps the land from tipping. The traps that cost paradise and freedom that turn second sons to firstborn. A litany of unburning bushes and smote rocks. 
a legion of covenants sealed by food and by fire, sacrifice after sacrifice. I free myself from the owner's hand and run through the biblical models. Never take a bite out of curiosity. Never trade your good name out of hunger. And even if a public bombing strikes you in a private way, hide that from everyone, lest you be called out to lead them.